so happy to be communicating with you. Oh man, let's talk about communication even more. <laughs> let's communicate about the communicating. Meta, you know, they call that meta communication. Meta we communication. are communicating about communicating. Whoa. <laughs> Ooh. Today's episode is all about communication in your relationships and where you might be getting stuck. But before we get started on that, um, we have a great, we asked a bunch of people, send us different ways for intros because we're awkward and weird. And um, amazing listener, Abby wrote in, what's your favorite thing about each other? Do you want me to go first? Yeah. I I'm feel like thirsty. We talk- <laughs> I feel like we've said, we talk about this all the time, but my favorite thing about you is how open you are to like other people Mm. all the time. And I know that sometimes hurts you in ways, (laughs) you know, so I don't, yeah, I love that about me too. I'm trying, you know, you know, I think, but, but it's a quality that you have that I, I, partly wish like I was able to embody within myself. And so just, I very much value that in you because it's something that once again, I wish I had, I just, I just very much appreciate that about you. And I know that other people do too. Obviously I'll help you on the boundary end of things, but I love that about you. And I also love how hilarious you are. (laughs) My favorite thing I'm proud of. Wow, Abby, I really like this one because it got to start out with me getting a bunch of compliments. Right. And I really like that. <laughs> no, Jen, I think the thing is you might not be open to other people, which sometimes I think is a very good thing. But what is so special about Jen is she makes everyone feel like home. Aww. Because, yeah, I think because you are so safe, you have learned how to take care of yourself so well it feels like there's room for other people. And I think the reason that so many people want to be close to you is because I think you feel like home, like a healthy, non-toxic, chaotic home. What most of us want our homes to be like. That is really nice. Thank you. Oh, this was a lovely intro. Yeah, this one's fun. Let's just keep doing this. Let's just keep doing nice things. We're so connected to each other. That is really nice. I keep saying to M, you know, for our 10 year anniversary for the therapy group, we are going to use all of our credit card points and go on a, a quick vacation with each other. We've been talking about this for the past five years. We've never used a single credit card. We don't go because we don't go on vacation. And we, we, we don't ever leave the Philadelphia area. And I'm just so excited for that trip. And it made me think because we're so connected right now. We're going to be so connected on that trip. We were like, we just want to lay on a beach. Yes. But we said that the first rule of the trip is the first day nobody speaks. (laughs) Right. Yes. We We were like, we need a day. We're not going to talk at all. Yes. That's not going to happen. Probably not. But I I think we could get the first 15 minutes. Absolutely. (laughs) You think even 15? No chance. No, you know, I, this is total non sequitur, but I was talking to my husband because I watch a lot of true crime. Yes, you do. And, um, we were talking about like, how long would it take you to like call the cops and determine that like, I'm a missing person. Oh, good question. Isn't that a good question? And I was thinking about you because we literally (laughs) talk constantly. If Bill called me and I hadn't talked to you for 28 minutes, (laughs) missing person yeah you were part of our conversation because he was like so if you said you're gonna be home and you you didn't call or you weren't answering I would call Emily obviously (laughs) because you guys talk constantly yes um always connected right so like my question for you is like how long would it take you to report me as a missing person 23 minutes because I always talk to you every 20 I know. Let me think. Only three, <laughs> only three minutes of me not answering. I mean, gotta be by the phone. <laughs> emergency! I'm in the police station. I'm right. wreaking havoc. I am smashing my fist on the table. They're like, "How long has it been?" You're like, "It's been three minutes." <laughs> You're like, "Here's the situation, though. We talk every two. <laughs> <laughs> now I know something's wrong. Wow, that's a great point. Because like I, I feel like it's easy for me to go missing in action. <laughs> like I love totally you for me. Like I'm like, oh, okay, bye. Because also I would assume you're either with Millie. Yeah. 
or you're chatting it up with someone. I'm chatting it up. Usually I'm chatting it up. You're chatting it Maybe up. Maybe one of someone. Millie's teachers, like I'm like hanging. So, that she's hanging. And so probably like if if all I didn't talk to you all day. That would be so weird. It would be so and I was reaching out, I'd be like, things are happening with the business. Like, can we talk about this? Blah blah blah. And you weren't responding to me. Okay, but when you were out of commission from a kidney stone, I was on the it, phone with you. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a few hours where you were sleeping that that's wasn't, true. You, you were going in and out of sleep a lot but you knew i also figured if you weren't answering maybe you actually just finally went to the fucking er right i didn't <laughs> and then when i didn't hear from you at night i texted bill the next morning yeah that was so nice because you had texted me at one i woke up at six i didn't there wasn't like it just like i have kidney stones that was it It wasn't like and i'm leaving the hospital or the dream right. is just an i have kidney stones and say what you said to bill <laughs> <laughs> I, I just texted bill and was like hey don't let jen work today yeah <laughs> i said <laughs> bill whatever you do take her laptop from her don't let her work today she like needs to take care of her body it was really and trying bill responded <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with a gif jif we've never figured this out of rocky running through the italian market and it just says do you need a therapist i'm i'm hired <laughs> like he would come and replace you as a clinician yeah yeah no totally what, i think he's confused about what he, you do for most of your day one million percent. clients mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep he's definitely confused and that's okay also, he's also confused about you know what it like takes he, to become a therapist. Jill always thinks he should be a therapist. He is always trying to get hired by the therapy group. It's because I've been giving him sneaky, sneaky therapy, therapy for years and years and years. So basically, he's trained, lightly trained. He's trained, light, light, a light training, a diet a light training, tra a um, a splendid <laughs> training. But splendid the thing, training. <laughs> the thing about that is, though, he would be a horrific therapist. Horrible terrible he would really be poor like when we did that episode about like therapy and they talked about like bad shit therapists have said like bill like a client of bills would be like he just told me to get over it yes one thousand percent yeah he'd be like ah next <laughs> or what his favorite thing to say is us is why are you guys being like this yeah we're like, we're like what do you mean why oh, why are you thinking he, he is dying to come on the podcast He's dying to come on the podcast dying i won't let he him. would actually probably be really funny okay so maybe we'll bring him on like maybe we should let bill come on the podcast he, he has some shit to talk about he has some serious shit to talk about he would have a great episode actually you okay. would hate it i would die you would be freaking the fuck out maybe yeah. just bill and i do the episode and i'll just should i just not be there at all wow yeah. I would still die. No, you because you couldn't give up the control of not yes, being able I have to manage such, what he says. I have such control. <laughs> I can't. I can't. But maybe. Okay, maybe we'll put out a poll and see if people yeah, are interested. It's a great idea. But it's funny to talk about because in many relationships, we have lots of different types of communication. And let's talk about communication and relationships. Ah, so so good. um general question that people wrote in is how do I get better at communicating? Like that question was essentially rewritten 500 times with different ways of um, asking this question. And the reality is, is that we don't get better at communicating without communicating. Yes. The only way we get better at anything is trying to do something different and trying different stuff. And I think we have this idea that we're going to get better in the moment, right? So the immediate reaction of a response. The thing is, is that usually the way we get better at communicating is when we come back three days later and we think, hey, I've really thought about what you said a lot and it hasn't been sitting well with me. And typically, if you're still thinking about interaction, it means that there's some processing to do around it. Yeah. I I would also want you to ask yourself, like, what are your pain points specifically with communicating? Like, are you someone who is reactive? Are you yelling? Are you shutting down? Are you, you know, everyone is different with their struggles with communication. Typically these develop from early childhood and we bring them into adulthood. But I would want to know specifically what makes it difficult for you to communicate. Um, you know, I think sometimes in communicating, if you're someone who maybe shuts down or holds things in, you, 
in the moment may have a hard time articulating yourself or feeling like you can articulate yourself in a way that keeps you from being emotional and that's okay. So I would just want to first identify what specifically you struggle with in communication. And then I would want you to ask yourself, what would it take to work on this? What does this look like to work on this? Um, does it mean, you know, if I'm yelling, you know, and trying to communicate, if I'm too reactive, then does that mean I need to take a time out when I'm starting to feel myself get reactive? What does it feel like in my body when I'm starting to get reactive? How can I start to self-soothe? Um, if you're someone who shuts down, uh, to ask yourself, what do I need in those moments when mm -hmm. I shut down to bring myself back into the conversation? So I think the first step to figuring out how to work on your communication is to figure out what your pain points are in the communication specifically. Yeah. So let's go through. Some people did identify their pain points. Are you ready? Let's do it. I'm ready. Okay. So uh, how to leave space for your quiet partner to speak more. I lead every serious conversation. So there's quite a few people that wrote in basically about being the, um, the external processor or the over processor, um, AKA the Emily. And sometimes when we talk about, a lot of people wrote in, we're going to use the term unbridled self-expression. I over-express myself. I over-talk. Um, somebody else wrote in and said, I'm an open book. My husband is not. He likes to process in silence and I need a play-by-play. -play. And I think the thing is, is when you are someone who is such um, an outward expression person and processor, and you have some of this unbridled self-expression, you think you need it, right? This person said, I need a play-by-play. -play. You don't need right? That's what feels comfortable. But I would ask yourself, is it actually doing what you think that it's doing? The yeah. same thing with people that do all internal processing. Do you actually need that? Or do you have to try something a little bit different? Because typically the thing I always do, it's not like I'm the right one and you're the wrong one. It usually means both of us needs to creep a little bit more towards the middle. Yes. I think something too, if you're someone who processes out loud, um, if you feel that your partner's shutting down, I think that a knee jerk reaction is to talk more, right? Like if maybe if I say the right thing, my partner's going to come out of their shell, maybe yes. they're going to start expressing themselves or I'm going to feel better. I'm going to get, or I'm, right. Or I'm going to feel better. better. And, but the thing that I would suggest that you work on is instead of talking at your partner, see if you can start asking them questions, mm -hmm. right? Try to slow yourself down and start to ask them questions like, Hey, this is how I was feeling about this. I'm wondering, how are you feeling about this? Like what's yeah. going on for you? Or like, what was this experience like for you? And that can come from your curiosity. And I think that we, especially if you're someone who's processing externally, the assumption is that, okay, my part, if I do this, my partner's going to be able to model this. Like, why can't they just do this? Right. If you're someone who processes internally to have the space, to be able to express yourself and have someone ask you questions is so incredibly helpful. It, it really helps you to be able to get out of your shell. And I would also encourage you if you're someone who processes externally to really slow yourself down because your partner shutting down is not a message that they don't care about you or they don't have anything to say. It's that they're not used to processing things out loud. And if you give them space and slow yourself down um, and really sit with what they're saying, it's going to be more and more comfortable for them to be able to communicate with you. So your challenge as the external processor is going to be slowing yourself down and giving your partner space when they actually are expressing themselves yeah. and being curious and asking them questions. And for the, for the person, the external presser, you might have to actually talk yourself down and say to yourself, stop talking, stop talking to yourself because it's so impulsive yes. that you're just like, blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, we're vomiting. And then it feels like you just have to keep going because you just have to get out. You have to get out because you're so actually uncomfortable in the situation. So you may have to like, Take your hands, sit on them and say to yourself, like, don't hold your fucking mouth shut. Like talk yourself through that process. Yeah. Um, because the thing is, is that if you, I had, um, I have a family friends that like, so my parents, best friends, they had twin girls and the one girl was such a talker and the other girl was super, super quiet twins. 
And the quiet one started just talking to the twin. And so the sister communicated everything for her. And although it got the needs met, she got the dinner she wanted or the clothes she wanted or whatever, it did not help with having her have any external relationships. And so also by us over speaking and over functioning and over compensating, it doesn't allow somebody else to have space to communicate. If I talk nonstop, nobody else gets a word in. Absolutely. <laughs> I was, I that was, was me getting that was me getting a word in. I was looking at the questions. <laughs> so, you were like giving yourself your own therapy in the <laughs> oh, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> And you're like, I don't care. Let Emily talk all day. Yeah, yeah. I was like, thing. please keep because going. The, the, the less talker actually wants the other person to keep going because they don't really want to do it either. Well, well, you're right. Let me ask you a question because obviously I'm the internal processor. Yes. As you were saying, that twin story was bringing up for me, like my brother was always the talker, you know, and he was always the one expressing himself. He, you know, it was like important to him. Yeah. And for me, I loved it. Right. I thought he was hilarious. I was just enjoying, you know, I was just observing. I told, always took the observant role. So that was going to be my question for you is like, how did, do you have a sense of like how that developed for you being more of like the external processor? Yeah. My brother could keep everything inside and then, oh. then he blows up. Oh, so he really held things in. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think he didn't have the skills younger. I mean, he's also a socialized man, right? Like, right. so like the reality is. Although your brother, your, your brother is socialized, man. Yeah. But my brother's a different yeah, he really breed. Is. He is <laughs> he a different really breed. Is. I know. I He's know. Like, uh, um, I uh, don't understand Yeah, me. Yeah. But not the same. So I feel like my brother. Yeah. I mean, I was a talker. Like I remember being like a younger kid and him be like, you remember you to like, you know, actually order pizza on the phone on a Friday night yes. and he would be, my mom would be like, oh wait, we can order like Domino's or whatever tonight. And my brother would be like, okay, Emily's going to, Emily's going to call. Wow. And they would like make me call for him. Wow. Yes. That's really interesting. Oh, good yeah, to know. It's so interesting. It's so interesting that it, like it came from our siblings. It comes from your siblings sometimes. Wow. I do. I think that there's really something to that. And and then I think for a lot of people, if you grew up at a home where there wasn't space for you to talk, it could feel really uncomfortable or it feels like you could never stop talking because you never had enough. Right. And so I think it can play out in a few different ways. Absolutely. Um, um, what do we okay, got? wait, I have one for you that I think is very important. Okay, tell me. How to learn to identify and work through the emotions. Sometimes I just don't know. And I think that that is another thing is that Sometimes if we don't know what we're feeling, we just keep talking and talking and talking, hoping we're going to get there. Yeah. And then that just makes us get farther away from the feeling. Yeah. Um, I would work on this skill outside of your communication with your partner and your relationship. It's possible that you have learned to focus more on other people's feelings or that your feelings don't matter, or you have learned in some way to separate yourself from your own emotions, or you didn't have the language to figure out what you were actually feeling. This is a skill that will transform your life in so many ways. And it sounds so simple, but it's really not, especially if you haven't learned the language for it. So I legitimately would Google a feelings wheel, print that feelings wheel out. Actually, Emily got these cool ass feelings wheel stickers that okay, she they're put from on Etsy. They're from Etsy. Maybe they we should post them. Of, yeah. Let's I'll, support I'll a small link, business. Yes. Yeah. I'll post them. Um, um, but anytime, and, and it's possible that you notice other things first. Like you might notice tightness in your body. You might notice yourself like getting tired. Like you might notice like physical sensations mm -hmm. first, or you might see your reaction first, right? Where like you're getting anxious or you're getting angry or, and so anytime that happens, not just in your relationship, anytime, right? Like where, if you're driving and you're anxious about being late, whatever it is, what is underneath that anxiety? What's the emotion that's coming up for me? Look at your feelings wheel. If you're not driving, obviously that's a safety hazard, but look at your feelings wheel to really figure out what you're feeling, because if you can name it, you can tame it. My new tattoo I'm going to get. Yes. Yep. I think that is. <laughs> 
Um, so that's really important. So that's the first step is this is a learn skill, a practice I want you to do outside of your conversations. Then you're going to start bringing them into your communication because it is much harder to identify what you're feeling when you are in the thick of an argument. Oh, I thought right? it was a good one. Tell me. If you could identify, you can let it fly. Whoa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's good. That's good. I I think, you know, I think we could come up with a bunch of rhymes. Who doesn't love rhyming? I love a rhyme. <laughs> it's It makes it so much easier to remember things. So remember this, if you can name it, you can take it. If you can identify, you can let it fly. Wow. That is so good, Em. And that tattoo will have a bird. <laughs> wow. That's a great idea. That's a great I idea. I just emailed my tattoo artist last night for three new tattoos. Oh my God. Where are you getting them? Finish get your sleeve? One, I'm going to finish my sleeve. One is, I'm, I'm, I'll post when I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Don't tell me. Because what if I don't end up getting them? You know what I mean? Like last right, time, right, right. if I ended up with something different, so like, I don't really yeah. know. And then people and are going to be like, how dare you lie? She lied <laughs> about her potential tattoo. Right. That's fair. That's fair. It's fair. Which is a great question because somebody <laughs> asked, um, uh, um, how to know the difference between being honest and being harsh. Wow. Right. The saying is honesty without tact is cruelty. So you can be honest, but people that are honest people, myself included, um, sometimes are assholes. Are you being mean? Right. Are you being hurtful? Are you being callous? Right. And the thing is, is if I'm getting harsh, here's a good way to know if I'm being honest or being harsh. If I'm making it completely about the other person, it's harsh. If I am talking about our relational interactions and improving that and some things that we both have a part in, that's honest. Yeah. This isn't, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I keep going because no, I was no, no, going to no. bring up another question. If I don't stop talking, there won't be space for you. Oh my God. So sweet. <laughs> but you have important things to say. <laughs> <laughs> um. This question, may, it, the question you just asked made me think of this question too. And I think it's similar in a way, being assertive, but not controlling how. And I just want to differentiate between being assertive and being controlling where being assertive is communicating your needs and opinions and your boundaries confidently and respectfully and expressing yourself clearly and like maintaining open and honest communication where controlling is more forceful it's manipulative it's dominating and it's and for and you one use, result you want one ending control is to get is one ending right is to right. control another person and when you're controlling another person there is no relational intimacy mm -hmm. right so it's an important thing to differentiate in your own behavior whether you are asserting your needs. And here's the thing, you can say, hey, this is really important to me in a relationship. You know, it's really important to me that, you know, I don't know, like come home and we like cook dinner together. That's one thing, yeah. right? To be like, this is, you know, it makes me feel connected to you. That would be assertive. Being controlling is like, you need to come home and cook dinner with me or I'm not talking to you the rest of the night. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Punishment afterwards. Punish. Right. There's a punishment. There's a the result that you want, right? You're coercing the person into doing something to meet your needs. Yeah. It's different from just being open and communicative about your needs. Your partner still has, you know, autonomy and agency over the decisions that they make, right? Where they can say, hey, listen, I had a really tough day. Like I need to sit down. I understand that's important to you. And that's something we can do in the future where you are expressing your needs, your partner's responding to your needs and saying, hey, maybe I can't meet them tonight, but I can meet them tomorrow night. It's very different than controlling someone. So I want to help, if you're listening to this, help you differentiate between the actions that might be controlling and then asserting your needs because asserting your needs is important, but to do yeah. it in a way that maintains connection and intimacy in the relationship is essential. Yeah. I think people also, your partner doesn't work for you. <laughs> right. I think that's like an important thing for us to like put in our minds, right? Yes, that like yes. we work like together as a team 
you are not their boss. And I think if you are the partner who's been the over-functioning partner or you take on a lot of the mental load, sometimes we can speak to our partner as if we are their boss, like delegating activities. And that's not going to help. It might be that more shit gets done for like, you know, the next week. It might be like like the small improvement, but like long-term that it's not going to do shit here's like a, like, just listen to the smallest shift in this communication. You ready? Yes. Um, did you do the laundry? Did you do, did you do this? Did you do this? Can you do the laundry? Do you have space to do this? Do you, are you able to do this to help support me? Did you, or do this is different than can you, and do you have the space for this? Yeah. You were something, leaving room for the other person. Something yeah. our couples therapist always does when, you know, inevitably my unbridled self-expression has to be um, just like slightly altered. Um, <laughs> uh, whenever she like, sometimes I'll say something and she's like, all right, I'm going to rewrite that for you and you're going to say it again. And she always begins it with, hey, hon. And this okay. like delicate, like a little bit of a Southern accent. She's like from, I, she must be from down South. Um, and she has a little bit of this like twang where she's like, hey, hon. Can you throw a load of laundry in before you move on to your, before, you know, whenever you have a moment today? And that greeting with curiosity and compassion and admiration. What would it be like to talk to your partner like you actually like them? Right, right. I mean, it's a good, right? Like as, if a, I, like, as opposed to like, well, did you do the laundry? Like I yeah. had asked you to do the laundry. And listen, and here's the thing, if you are feeling like that all the time, and so, and you know, somebody's listening to this and it's like, yeah, but that's the only thing that works. Yeah. If that is the only thing that works, there is larger issues here. Yes. And that's the thing is the majority of times we cannot tell you, we should fucking keep track of this for the next month. The amount of times that a couple comes into the practice and they're saying to work on communication. It is rarely about communication that the communication gives us the insight into all the other dynamics that are happening. Yeah. So if it feels like the only way to get your partner to be involved in something with your life is to force them to be, or to make them to be, or to control them to be, there's something else going on. Right. Maybe and you, you also feel... shouldn't have to do that. Right. Right. And underneath that, Maybe you're feeling like, okay, my partner doesn't care about my needs or I'm not feeling cared about by my partner, right? I'm not feeling loved by my partner. And it's coming out in all these different ways. And it brings me to this question. Why do we have the same fight over and over? Starts with something and always ends the same. Because what you're fighting about is not really what you're fighting about. Ever. Ever. There is so (laughs) much underneath that. And what happens is that we end up process talking about the content of what's going on in the house and not the the process of how we talk about those things. And then what's underneath that content, right? Mm -hmm. Where underneath it is not feeling cared about. I'm not feeling supported. I'm not feeling connected to you, right? It is so much, it feels so much safer to fight about the laundry or fight about whatever your schedules then to say even your in-laws in your in-laws right then to say hey I'm I'm not feeling supported by you I'm not feeling cared about by you can we talk about ways in which we can come together on this right it doesn't feel it feels so vulnerable to do that and it feels so much easier to fight about the minutiae of the day yeah And so that is why you keep having the same fight over and over again is because you're not getting down to the root of what is causing these fights. Yeah. And so in order to do that, I would ask yourself, you know, what's underneath the laundry? What are you, what are you not feeling? How can you communicate that differently in a larger sense Then through these tiny little fights throughout the day, how can you sit down together and have a real deep, honest, vulnerable conversation about that? Um, uh, Wait, did we talk about that? That uh, the phrase I heard from Elemental about anger. Did we talk about this? I have no idea. Here's the thing: we talk all the time, so I don't know know. about the podcast or. But say it anyway. Well, there was a really good phrase that I heard on this lovely Pixar movie. um, (laughs) That was um, 
anger is things that are just weren't ready to be said yet if it comes out in anger it means that there was like so for whatever reason I wasn't ready to say it but it just came out Mm -hmm. and so a lot of times there's stuff we're not ready to say but usually it's important that we say it yeah and when we talk about ready there's no perfect time to have hard conversations there's better context to have it there's better ways to have it but I think sometimes things just have to get said and they're imperfect yeah. in a way. Yeah. But somebody asked a question that we have to address because we're therapists and we love communication, which is, can you over-communicate? Um, at what point does it get unhealthy? Yes, you can. Yes. If you're, yeah, there's lots of times. We can't just talk about, remember we talked about analysis paralysis on previous episodes? You just fucking talk about shit all the time. Yeah. There's, it's not enough action. Yes. At some point we can sit here and talk shit on your, on, you know, your mother-in-law for the next 10 years, or you could say, I guess we have to find a different, a better way to navigate this relationship. Yeah. And that often does not mean cutting someone off. It means, okay, let's you and I come up with a plan of how we support each other through those times. Right. Like, and so uh, you can absolutely over communicate. And usually if we're talking about the same things over and over again, we're not communicating effectively and we're just fixating on something else. Yes. And I, I, that's what I was going to say is like, what's the, to differentiate between like, is this over communication, something that's actually productive for the relationship, or is it a way that I'm trying to soothe my own anxiety or Mm -hmm. soothe my own pain and is communicating about it actually in the long run, helping our relationship or is it self serving in some way? Um, because at a point, right, there are pieces of this where you can work on self-soothing yourself. And as opposed to looking to the relationship to saying, I have to keep talking about this so that I feel better, right? If you do action and you come to a conclusion and that follows through, you know, sometimes we talk about things over and over to make sure that it keeps happening to protect ourselves from something bad happening again. Um, but I think you have to ask yourself at what point am I looking to soothe myself through communication in the relationship and is it turning into more of a compulsion rather than something that's actually productive? Okay. One last thing to communicate on. Okay. I like this one. I want to talk about this one. I choose. I choose. I I assert. (laughs) The difference between, quote unquote, nothing makes you happy and having your needs not met. So I think some people feel like they are bottomless if they Mm. ask for certain things. What do you think about that? Mm. Um, Okay, honestly, I would ask yourself, is that true? (laughs) I mean, honestly, is it true? Is there, first I want to say, is there something, are you really communicating what's underneath those needs, right? I know I'm going back to the same conversation of like, you know, you might be communicating, like, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you, what's actually underneath all of those little things? Is there something bigger? Because if there's something bigger and that isn't being addressed, like that deep need, and that is not being addressed within your relationship, then you're going to keep focusing on the tiny little things. Mm -hmm. And that might be why in your relationship, your partner's saying to you, well, nothing's making you happy because there's something deeper and bigger that isn't being addressed here. Um, And that deeper, bigger thing maybe is coming from your relationship or, or an end, maybe it's coming from deeper wounds from childhood too, that also need to be addressed. So I think that there's a duality here of figuring out what are the things that can be met within my relationship? But I also think we have to understand that your partner cannot meet every single one of your needs. And I think that we really set ourselves up for failure when we say, when you get married or when you get into a serious, your partner is supposed to complete you and meet every single one of your needs. (laughs) And in reality, (laughs) that is not true. Um, The most important thing is that you know how to take care of yourself first so that you can communicate and express what you also need in the relationship. And so 
once again, it's hard to not have context in this sense, because I would ask yourself, where is this coming from for me? Is there something deeper underneath the things that I'm asking of my partner? Um, or on the flip side of things, your partner saying to you, nothing makes you happy. Is that also, is that just an out for them? That's another option, right? Yeah. Where they're saying, well, oh, you're never happy. You don't, right? Is that a way to invalidate your emotions? Yeah. That is another option. If that feels like that's always happening, like, oh, well, you always say this. I never, you know, I'm doing so much for you. You never, and if it's a way to invalidate your emotions, then that's, an, that's another conversation. Yeah. And so in that, what's underneath that, if your partner is always invalidating your emotions, the thing that you might be missing is that your emotional needs are not being met within the relationship. So there's so many different contexts and nuances to this. I think you can ask yourself some questions to figure out like, where is this coming from for me? Yeah. Are you ready for Dear Emma Jen? I'm ready. Dear Emma Jen, I'm a 37 year old single mom. Last October, I had to move with my parents due to reasons out of my control with the house that I was renting. I was so nervous about dating and feeling embarrassed that I lived with my parents. I've dated a handful of guys since then, and the ones I actually told didn't really seem to care. And so the last guy I went on two dates with, everything was going great, and then he texted me yesterday saying he's looking for someone with more independence. I feel crushed, embarrassed, ashamed, and defeated. Any advice to help me get through this hard time? As if a divorce and being a single mom isn't hard enough. Thank you. Mm. You know, you know, it's, it's when you are struggling with your biggest insecurity and yeah. someone calls it out, it hits so hard, right? Mm -hmm. Cause it sounds like this incredible woman has, is struggling with the fact that she's moved back with her parents. She's feeling embarrassed and insecure about it. And it sounds like for the most part, people are like, oh, it's no problem. But it's like you could have a, a hundred people saying you're so wonderful. You're so wonderful. But if there, if one person calls out your biggest insecurity, it feels so unbelievably yeah. painful. And so my question is, why does this one person get to dictate how you feel about yourself? And my sense is that you are already feeling so insecure about this being in this place in your life. And so I would encourage you to have way more self-compassion and empathy towards yourself during this time. You said it yourself. I mean, being a single mom is so hard and you said it yourself, this was out of your control. And I think there's, you know, we have this idea of like where we should be at this age and where, what my life should look like. And when the reality doesn't match that, we place a lot of unnecessary judgments on ourselves and we forget to give ourselves the compassion and the understanding and the empathy that we really need at that time. So I would encourage this wonderful woman to work on her ability, your ability to give yourself more understanding, more self-compassion and more love during this time, because really it, it isn't necessarily about this guy. It's about you. Yeah. I have nothing to say. I think you were perfect. Okay. Thank you. You just did the outro. No, I, I just think, um, I want to hug this person a lot. Me too. And it sounds like you have done a tremendous job of navigating a life that maybe didn't turn out the way you had envisioned it would 10 years ago. And there is nothing fucking wrong with that. And let me be clear, there is nothing wrong with having people help you, whether it's living with somebody, whether it's helping you with bills, whether it's helping you with childcare, it does not matter. We are allowed to have support in this life. And this idea that you should be overly fucking independent or everyone should be so independent, that is some, that's some Western white bullshit, honestly. <laughs> that is, it's just, it, that's just, it doesn't have to be like that. Right. Everyone should deserve care and everyone should deserve that. And these things that you feel, I think they were already a part of your body yeah. and they came out big, yeah. but I actually think it's amazing that you moved it you got help with what you need to get right. help with Absolutely. that's it 
Absolutely. Um, thank you for listening to today's episode of Shrink Chinks. We hope we communicated well with you. We always ask you to rate, review, subscribe, follow on Apple Podcasts. You can check us out on YouTube at Shrink Chicks, on Instagram at Shrink Chicks or the therapy group. Um, we have amazing merch at shrinkchicks.com. You can check out our wonderful Know Yourself, Grow Yourself journal on Amazon. Um, uh, um, we would love to help you be matched with a therapist. If you were looking to restart your therapeutic journey, to begin your therapeutic journey, to switch over your therapy journey, wherever you are in your process, we would love to. We're in many, many states now. If you were interested in working with one of our clinicians, you can check out the therapygroup.com. Fill out a contact form. You'll be matched by Jen and I um, ourselves. It's what we do all day long and we love it so much. We believe in therapy. We believe in this work and we really believe in you. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day and don't forget that to grow yourself, you gotta know yourself. We'll talk to you next week. Hey.